Right, so if we move on um, to some other things to consider, um, it's, as obviously, as David has just said, is um, have your open discussion if you think it's, um, it's worth it with the management company, well, first of all, with the managing agent directors, but also, secondly, if you are a leaseholder and the management company, which is a party to the lease, has directors on it who are all leaseholders, then obviously you need to have your discussion with them as well if you're not happy with some of the issues. Um, and certainly I've had experience that as a director of our management company um, because it may be that we're completely oblivious, especially if we're not actually resident, we're not living on the scheme, um, which happens with me these days, is that you don't necessarily know what's going on on a daily basis, um, which again is why you might want to have directors on the management company who do live on the scheme. Um, mm. we, we just appointed, um, he's, it's Dave, uh, Chetwin. He's part of the committee, but he's, um, he's our mediator if you like, between us and the manager company. Because it's broken down so much where it's just, we're, you know, we're conflicting of interests and stuff. And he's meeting with them next week. So we'll have a meeting beforehand, he's going to go and have a discussion, we'll have a meeting afterwards, we, we think that's going to be a good way forward. Let's hope so. Yeah, Wait. Is it worth, Sean, just pausing for a second and looking at, to clarify in case anyone's unsure, the difference between a managing agent and a management company? Because <coughs> some people, I mean of Man Island, have a professional management company, but it's for others, we're directors of a management company, mm. and the work that the professional management company is doing in Man Island is the work that a managing agent would be doing if residents had an RMC yeah. or an RTM. Now, I know in the next session we're looking at very specifically all the details of setting up RTMs and RMCs mm -hmm. and what they are, but... I just didn't want there to be any confusion between those right. two. Well, you, you might find that some leases, and it was certainly, I don't know whether it's as popular these days, but um, you might find a lease where you've got the landlord, you've got a, a management company as a party to the lease, which may be um, a managing agent company, or it may actually say that the management company is owned by the landlord and but shares in the management company will be transferred to all leaseholders on sale of the last property within the estate, which is what happened on the scheme I've got a house on. Um, and in that case where you've got a management company as part of the lease, where you've got a clause that allows you to take over control of that management company, um, in that case you take over control on the um, sale of the last property and then you can then appoint your own managing agents and you have control over the whole management of that particular estate, which as I said is what happens with, with our scheme in South Ferry Quay. Um, you may have a lease where there's no third party at all, it's the landlord and it's you as leaseholder and the landlord has a completely separate contract between them and a management company dealing with the management. So the first thing you'd need to do is check what actually applies to your particular scheme. And if in fact you've got a management company and the um, clause in there and that allows you to take over control on the sale of the last property, check whether that's actually happened or not. Because certainly in our case, when we took control, because everyone was particularly annoyed with the managing agents and what they were doing, um, that we had the ability to do that, but we hadn't actually checked the lease and realised it until about <coughs> four years down the line, and then we actually transferred it over and took control. So do check that, it can be quite useful which is what I've just talked about in the second um, point on that slide. Um, so again, always have a discussion with your landlord if you're able to, um, um, but of course that will depend on relationships and if they have links to the management company or not. Um, a prime example is the example I just gave you about a receiver of a landlord, and it was one of the blocks just over here, um, where we I had a meeting with the lead people, leaseholders, with the receivers, to say this isn't working, we will be making an application to appoint a manager um, if in fact we don't sort this out and it's going to be a lot cheaper and less painful for everyone if you just appoint a new managing agent and that's what they did. So sometimes it will never work and sometimes it will so don't just discount that. Um, you need to consider do you want or have the right to manage? That may depend on <coughs> the makeup of the building, is there too much commercial space within that building? How is the building set up? Um, do you have 50% of the leaseholders who are prepared to actually 
engage in the right to manage if you don't it's a non-starter so those are the sort of things that you need to look in into um, and I understand that you'll be looking at that in a bit more detail in one of the other sessions I've had something at the moment um, which I'm acting for the right to manage company that they did their own notice of claim and set it up and the landlord who's managing agent is Regent is um, has specifically given a counter notice saying it's not actually a building that is appropriate for right to manage but we think it is but they haven't given the reasons why so we've had to go to a tribunal for a declaration that we think we have got the right to manage and that's just going through at the moment but they've been non-specific they've made complaints about every single aspect of the process that's been carried out for the right to manage without actually giving any detail of why they're complaining so they forced us to take this step so it'll be quite interesting to see what actually happens at the end of that so any experiences from anyone or comments on those points is anyone here involved in a right to manage yes um, it goes back some years now this is Waterloo Warehouse um, getting 50% is enormously hard work um, and, and really people have to go into it with their eyes open purely because of that well, I'm doing a scheme at the moment that I was first instructed, I think, last April. And um, we've only just hit the 50% of people actually getting, having sufficient membership, I think, a few weeks ago. So I've not been even been able to proceed to deal with the notice of claim, and it's just dragged on and dragged on. Because there's a lot of non... Um, or it's a lot of buy-to-let landlords, basically. Mm -hmm. And people are not as actively engaged, and even the directors are not particularly engaged either. So it's a bit of a nightmare even getting instructions. Yes. You know, our experience of regent management was like trying to move our whole block by pulling it um, in terms of the inertia that um, uh, we, we, we um, uh, experienced. Um, in the end, once the block started moving, they gave in and we did quite well out of it. But boy, it was hard work. Mm. Right, and then uh, This might be coming in a later session, but what's the criteria for a leaseholder agreeing? What, what, what actually has to take place? Is it one-off? Um, just get it to sign a form? Is that it? You basically, you, you have to set up a right to manage company, so there has to be certain people who are prepared to stand up to the plate because there's a fair bit of work involved. Um, you then need to um, find, normally what will happen is, or my experience of what has happened for other schemes I've acted for in a right to manage, is that you need to sound everyone out to check whether you've got your 50%. Um, and also you get them to contribute towards the legal costs of doing that at that stage so you know whether they're, they're going to say they're definitely going to go for it. Once the right to manage company has been set up then you just send an invitation out to all leaseholders and ask them to sign a membership form. But that's the thing for me, it's taken six months to get 50%. I take it the 50% is 50% um, of leaseholders, not 50% of apartments or no. whatever. It's also per block as well, if you've got different blocks. Yeah. It's not just a cross-cut block. Yeah. Well, no, 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 it depends how yeah. they're classed, but in ours there's 11 different blocks and they're all classed individually. Mm -hmm. And you have to have 50% of each. What's the likely legal cost of setting up this initial? Um, well, certainly we do it on a fixed fee and it depends on the, the, um, the number of leaseholders because of the interaction with everyone. But say, we've just done one recently for 40 odd leaseholders and that was a fixed fee of £2,000 plus VAT and then there was a 50 quid set up company costs and various other things but you also have to pay the landlord's legal costs for dealing with it um, and on one I've had recently the landlord was trying to claim £6,500 and we've had to argue about that Okay, this, <coughs> this is in depth of oh, what's going to happen yeah. next time so the, the right to manage and the RMC stuff and residence associations and the all the legal implications what you have a right to will be dealt with in, this, in the next session so and that'll be particularly useful to you alan and then andy that's it are you okay and alan at armstrong key we had a conflict of interest really between the managing company and the managing agents who were affected with the same people we set up uh, a company we incorporated a company with a view to RTM. But we didn't go down the procedure, which is quite prolonged, isn't mm. it? Protocol. We simply threatened to sue the 
two companies could say for breach of covenant and the lease, and then and join then the freeholder because it, it, it you know um, by implication <coughs> and they back down you say and they they actually re resigned as the management company and the managing agents. So we didn't we didn't have to do the RTM mm. procedure, and it, it's just I'm just pulling in if if you threaten to sue. You might just get a result without having to go through the process. Yeah. Which is why I'd always say, have your discussion, which is why it was my first point mm. um, on this slide, that um, you, you need to explore all other alternatives, really, um, before you start going down any of the RTM or, or, or other routes yeah. or appointing a manager, because they're long, drawn-out, potentially costly processes when one conversation may do it for you, yeah. or, or one legal letter. <coughs>